Juan Acha was a proliferous writer. He was equally interested in German Expressionism or the Renaissance, social art history or the semiotics of comics, male art or the pictorial psychology of Francis Bacon. Juan Acha was a remarkable art critic with a broad humanistic gaze. Born in Peru in 1916, he played a central role in the emergence of Latin America as an aesthetic subject, the subcontinental region as the place for the production of a revolutionary art theory. Member of a group of art critics fully connected with the social disruption of the 60s, Acha galvanized artists into action and made the case for what he called the need of a visual thinking out of Latin America. It is well known that Juan Acha participated in landmark congresses such as the Symposio de Austin in Texas or Primer Encuentro Iberoamericano de Críticos de Arte y Artistas Plásticos in Caracas. He organized as well emblematic events such as the Primera Bienal Latinoamericana de Sao Paulo in 1978 or Primer Coloquio Latinoamericano de Arte No Objetual y Arte Público in Medellín, Colombia in 1981. It is difficult to neglect today that Juan Acha was a key figure in the second half of the 20th century. However, he was a marginal thinker, an outsider with an orthodox views. He experienced rejection, institutional animosity, ostracism and even racism. Art historians despise his work, sometimes buckily until very recently. Common arguments are he is too conceptual, too theoretical, too convoluted, too much informed by Marxism and sociology. After he passed in 1995, his archive and personal papers experienced the same sort of contempt. But Juan H. had strong principles and a clear goal, to escalate Latin American art criticism from intellectual craft into theory. In other words, art criticism was for him a conceptual toolkit with a decolonial agenda. He defended aesthetics as a broad, non-philosophical and non-academic domain. Expanding the disciplinary frames of art history, he was interested in a variety of fields such as Gestalt, cybernetics, semiotics, eco-aesthetics and reception theory, among many others. This is not the topic of this talk, but he was instrumental in connecting the historical development of the avant-garde in Latin America with the work of authors such as Marshall McLuhan, Harold Innes, Herbert Marcuse, Michel Foucault, Humberto Eco, Roland Barthes, Robert House, Levi Strauss, Louis Althusser, or Jacques Lacan. And attached to any academic school, Juan H. defended the vision of Latin America as a region devoted to produce concepts and to inform theory. Eco in Oswald Andrade and the modernista poem Pau Brasil Manifesto, he saw Latin American art criticism as a translatable and exportable resource, as a struggling voice derived from the very conditions of third world under development. For him, Latin America was a living organism, a corporeal subject rather than an object of a study. His work is a search for the theoretical voice of this geoesthetic entity. He always expressed his conviction that the role of critics is to give shape to a revolutionary visual thinking emerge from the political conundrum of the region. In his early political writings, composed before he abandoned Lima in 1971, he talks quite a lot about the relation between conceiving concepts, conceptuar, and the possibility of a cultural revolution in the continent. In one way or another, he asserts, artists are taking an active role in our revolutionary awakening. They are beginning to conceive of and spread the need for cultural revolution. And unquote. Now, conceiving concepts or conceptuar as an aesthetic political action on the one hand and conceptual art as a component of Western art history are two different or even contradicting things for him. For Juan Acha, the very category conceptual art was controversial, mostly because of the anti-sensorial understanding of the term, an idea defended by authors such as Lucy Lippard or Simone Machan Fis in those days. Anaesthetic tautologies, as a solipsist abstract terrain with no social root, was for Acha not only idealistic, but also a contradiction. As you are probably aware of, 
The Spanish philosopher Marchand Fis characterized Latin American conceptual art in 1972 as ideological. But he was not alone. The category actually prevailed. In his History of Conceptual Art, commissioned by Fidon Press in 2011, Peter Osborne defines Latin American conceptual art as follows. Ideological content is the key word of Latin American conceptual art. In contrast to the most formal concerns of American and European conceptual art, ideology in itself was the fundamental material identity of the conceptual proposition. Unquote. Unlike this, any form of artistic practice based on the axiological disassembling of concepts, matter, and the senses is for Juanacha ideological in itself. From this point of view, Sole with sentences on conceptual art are syntactically and politically ideological. At the same time, to command arte is an informed and a materialized critique of ideology. As you can see, Juan Acha invert the idea of Latin American conceptualism as essentially ideological and describes the idea of art as idea as pure ideology. The very attempt to dematerialize art is in his view absurd in the sense that, beyond the physicality of the artwork, labor, body, time and values always have material and political implications and connotations. Non-objectalism, the category coined by Juan Acha, differs from the materialized art simply because it pays close attention to what Karl Marx calls living labor, a state of production and products, including artworks, in which material and non-material elements collapse, in which concepts and the general intellect collude. It became fashionable to talk about this as the sentir pensar, or thinking feeling. By the end of the 60s, Juan H. asked the following question. Is conceptual art in Latin America facilitating new forms of communicational guerrilla in Latin America? The answer for him was no. The cultural revolution seems to be moving towards a different direction. Conceptual art, he asserts in 1968, has become nowadays a fashionable trend. This category romanticizes and is trapped in a bunch of philosophema. is an irrational mysticism, he concludes. Interestingly, he defines conceptual art as irrational, mystic and philosophically romantic, full of ideology, we could say. In a short article entitled Peru, Revolutionary Awakening, Juan Acha emphatically says the following, and I quote, Here in Lima, information as denunciation focuses on the written word, on the conceptual, and acquires the clear dimension of a cultural guerrilla war such that it would be a mistake to include the work of Raphael Hastings within so-called conceptual art." And unquote. As you can see, Acha makes a clear distinction between concepts or informational strategies on the one hand and conceptual art on the other. Obviously, it is not the lack of sensorial matter what distinguishes conceptual art from disruptive information or tactical communication. Conceptual art differs from the later when it refuses to participate in the aesthetic awakening of our political sensorium. The work by Raphael Hastings alluded in this paragraph is indeed quite interesting, involving the intellectual friendship between both Juan Acha and the artist. Held at the Institute for Contemporary Art of Lima, the piece consisted of two conceptual diagrams opposed in different walls of the gallery. One of them, entitled Desarrollo de la Pintura, The Development of Painting, contains the taxonomic description of Western painting in evolutionary terms, from enlightened aesthetics to pop art. In the other, entitled Juan Acha, Hastings presents a comprehensive scheme of Juan Acha, dissecting his life as an art critic in various panels, crisscrossing professional, psychological, economic, and political characteristic of the, his persona as an art critic committed to cultural revolution. In juxtaposing these two diagrams, Hastings is not attempting to neglect the sensorial dimension of concepts via dematerializing the artwork. 
On the contrary, he materializes the ideological architecture of Western art history in tension with the material labor of the art critic, establishing a sensorial and conceptual connection between the two panels. As we can see, Juan Acha was not interested in conceptual art per se. His critique of the category was indeed strategic, allowing him to characterize the revolutionary agenda of a quite different attitude he called ultra-activism, also involving concepts, information and communicational strategies. Ultra-activism, he says, is an attitude of artists rather than an artistic trend. Art and revolution collide, united by the same sociological demands. Ultra-activism emerged as a cultural realism similar to the social realism of the 30s, but different in one key point. This new one activates and effectively propagates the cultural revolution." Unquote. For Juan Acha, ultra-activist artists offer neither work of conceptual art nor political art as such, but rather a new objectual ecology and a new visual territory in which the sensorial capacities of the masses are converted into political instruments. In other words, the cultural revolution Juan Acha is trying to put on is based on political, communicational and conceptual strategies, a conceptually armed aesthetic propaganda. Juan Acha's cultural revolution is not an artistic revolution, but rather a somatic revolution aimed at agitating the state of things, at awakening the creative exercise of freedom among the Latin American jot. It is a matter, he says, of the sensorium of our third world, so colonized by the dictates of the official forces of Western culture. If I speak of a cultural revolution, my position is not political in the sense of being an adherent of Mao Zedong. This is a mistake. I am speaking of a cultural revolution in the sense in which it was laid out by North American blacks years ago, as well as by many young people, among them the upper echelons of hippies who questioned the old rules and cultural imperialism." Unquote. In his view, ultra-activism proposes a revolution in the revolution, in this case a somatic revolution within the social revolution. This attitude resonates with the postulates of the French author Régis Devray. As is well known, during the second half of the 60s, Devray was involved not only with the theorization but also with the praxis of Latin American revolutionary movements, publishing his emblematic book Revolution in the Revolution in 1967, the circulation of which was immediately broadened after his imprisonment in Bolivia as a result of his close relationship to Fidel Castro. In addition to offering a harsh critique of the sclerosis that was then afflicting Latin American communist parties, De Vrij's book championed Che Guevara's guerrilla warfare known as Foco Theory or Focismo as a revolutionary tactic and denied the validity of leftist political philosophies that presumed to be capable of achieving social revolution without an armed movement of the people, primarily peasants, and without practicing guerrilla warfare and direct actions. For De Vrij, the Peruvian revolutionary government was the fullest example of a failed revolution. As it is well known, General Velasco Alvarado installed himself in power on October 3rd, 1968, by means of a coup headed by military elites who opposed Fernando Belaunde's regime. This change of power without a popular basis was accompanied by ideological and political contradictions that were not unknown to the very practice of Peru's artistic avant-garde contradictions that would only be accentuated in 1969 when the revolutionary government put the directorate of the diffusion of agrarian reform in the hands of a group of avant-garde artists, ordering them to produce a new kind of visual propaganda for the state, to which they responded by adopting the poster as a means of mass communication. The visual politics of this directorate consisted in fusing apparently antithetical artistic strategies such as abstraction, kineticism and op art on the one hand, and social realism, popular iconography and pop art on the other. 
From this fusion, there emerged what Jesus Ruiz Duran defined as pop achorado, gusty pop, a tactical, politicized and ruralized appropriation of international pop in which, thanks to a visual language derived from comic books, the figure of the rebel Tupac Amaro II was fused with the revolutionary peasant. Elsewhere I have called this the visual focusing of the Peruvian agrarian reform. That was the political scenario in which Juan H. began to conceive his cultural guerrilla warfare, infusing the very foundations of the revolution into the sensorial basis of the popular masses. The revolution takes on another character, he asserts. They revolutionize the revolution, as someone has written. Thus, the cultural revolution becomes an inevitable and very often unnoticed practice of the anti-racist, the feminist, the pacifist, the student, the environmental anti-contamination groups, the hippies, the new left, all these dissident groups are activists carrying out the cultural guerrilla warfare. Unquote. Artists are key players in this guerrilla warfare, not because they are artists, but because they work on the terrain of conceptual and sensorial changes. In the same line, Concepts are revolutionary tools, not because they are freed from sensorial matter, but because they inform and activate our collective political sensorium. As you can see, Juan H. was sympathetic towards ultra-activist tactics. However, a couple of questions remain unanswered for him in those days. Is my own artistic criticism a revolutionary tool in accordance with ultra-activist attitudes? Is my writing participating in the revolutionary awakening on the way? This question have no easy answers. Again, the problem was the time now of the revolution, and our history as a discourse seems to be too slow, too heavy, too delayed. In an allusion to action painting, Juan Echa defined his own work as action writing. For him, Revolutionary art criticism had to harmonize with the happening-based tactics of the ultra-activist art. It is clear that at that moment criticism, theory and political practice were taking on disruptive connotations, which were shared by other critics such as the Brazilian Federico Moraes, who in 1970, without it having met Acha, referred to the Brazilian artistic guerrilla warfare in terms surprisingly similar to Acha's. Today, he says, the artist is a kind of guerrilla fighter, art is an ambush, a constant victim of artistic guerrilla war, the spectator is forced to sharpen and activate his senses, sight, hearing, touch and smell too, are now mobilized by plastic artists. In today's artistic guerrilla warfare, everyone is a guerrilla fighter and everyone takes initiative, Artists, critics, and the public continuously exchange their positions in the face of events. Even artists themselves can be victims to an ambush set up by spectators. In the same line, Acha's understanding of ultra activist conceptual information laid the foundations for what he himself characterized as inquiry writing putting both the traditional history of art and the discursive authority of critics on trial. If the new art aspired to be a movement, an overflowing, a sensorial interaction between subject and reality, the goal of the truly revolutionary art critic could be no other than not betraying the here and now of history. Society today, asserts Acha, denies the here and now of the individual, freedom, in the name of the there until then, the evolution, or the there and back then, Estism. It speaks of visual and measurable spaces, property and objects, prices war and promotes hate and mistrust. Young people propose peace, love and Dionysian joy. The Cultural Revolution is equivalent to a change of mentality in favor of a mutual respect and individual freedom." Unquote. In the same way that he theorized concepts as praxis, his own writings of the second half of the 60s were moved by the urgency to fuse theory and political action, driven by the need to revolutionize things. His understanding of ultra-activism invites the reader to become more than a mere spectator to the events of history. Juan H. himself expanded his work as an art critic, 
to the point of becoming a curator activist in 1969, when he convened 14 manipulators to carry out the group exhibition Papel y más papel, 14 manipulaciones con papel periódico. Held at the Fundación para las Artes, this exhibition expressed skepticism towards the advance of conceptual art in the line that Jorge Klusberg Caic had been spreading through categories like media art, art and technology, or and art cybernetics. Suspicious of these categories as the extension of so-called conceptual art, Papel y Mas Papel explored the manipulation of the news media and the censorship that had begun to be felt by newspapers that were critical of the putatively revolutionary reforms of General Velasco Alvarado's regime. For the exhibition, Acha proposed that artists act not as authors but as manipulators of informational material alluding to the artist's responsibility in modeling the political sensorial framework of communication and the machine-led production of information. Using only newsprint, the 14 manipulators made a variety of environmental and expressionist installations. By contrast, Acha's own contribution consisted of a two modules of geometrically piled newspapers echoing so-called primary structures a category that had originally been put into circulation by a show held at the Jewish Museum in New York in 1966, and later by Jorge Glusweber himself in Buenos Aires in 1967, when he organized Estructuras Primarias II at the Sociedad Hebraica. This piece subverts not only the relation between minimalism and conceptual art, but also Michael Fritz's critique of objecthood, in his influential article Art and Optic Hood, 1967, Fried demonizes primary structures for their literalness and theatricality vocation. In his view, these so-called specific objects force the viewer to act, to perform, as if in a theater, interrupting the transcendental message and the autonomy of the artwork. A stranger to Fried's contemplative aesthetics, Acha was concerned with the socio-sensorial waving together of information, structures, and the collective senses. Where Fried only saw theater, mimicry, and performance, Acha perceived the most embodied reality of art as social structure, an interpretation that was revealingly close to that of the Mexican artist Helen Escobedo, who, on defining the basis of the third and final Salón Independiente, 1970, proposed to only use paper and cardboard, arguing that those media were resources that were materially poor but conceptually luxurious. More than a simple art topograph installation, what Papel y Mas Papel inaugurated was the fusion of avant-gardeism and informational guerrilla warfare in Peru, concepts and ideas as ultra-activist materialized statements. Acha's piece was a non objectual installation in the sense that it paid full attention to matter, senses, literalness, and concepts at stake. The curatorial question is how to display this non objectual art today. Should this object be reconstructed? Should it be considered a sort of reenactment? In the archive, we keep newspapers from the day probably quite similar to those used by Acha in his installation. However, doing so would be an objectualist strategy, contradicting the political essence of the installation. The same day of the inauguration, we bogged the newspaper as every day and used it at the top of the visible pile, adding new literal and sensorial meanings to the original communicational tactics of the piece. Take these final ideas as a commentary on the politics of exhibiting the archive as a site specificity documentation. In fact, dealing with this sort of archives proves that the problem is not dematerialization, but rather the very process of objectualizing ideas, values, and concepts.